we haven't been having Sunday school, but we've been having a host of different speakers uh, present lessons throughout the summer, and uh, that sort of gave me a break, although I wouldn't call it a, a break with no purpose. I was continuing with reading and research and uh, to move things along to where we're at today. So uh, for those of you that, by my count, this is the fourth fall now that we have started with church history. We started four years ago, uh, intending at the time to only go for nine months. Well, that obviously went by the wayside a long time ago as we are now looking at uh, Lesson 107. So um, if you just <coughs> thinking out loud here, uh, Norm asked me to say for the sake of the video, um, that we are having a Bible conference here at the church at Grace Life Bible Church um, in October. That's the weekend of October 18th through the 20th. So if you're interested in uh, studying about the Gospels, the title of that conference is The Gospels Project. We're going to be looking at the different Gospels in Scripture. So if you're hearing this with enough time and you would like to uh, think about attending, we'd like to have you come out to the church here. Uh, please contact the church if you'd like any information. Uh, you can go to gracelifebiblechurch.com uh, to do that. So. Fourth year here, we are picking up this morning roughly with the year 1940, okay? So I, I have a couple points here. I have a general review to get started at the top. I have a general review. Thanks. Yep. Alright, there's a general review at the top just to sort of catch you up to speed or refresh your memory about a few things. And then about halfway down the first page, there's a specific review about Stam's ministry. So the title of this morning's lesson is Lesson 107, The Grace Movement Continues to Organize, C.R. Stam and the Berean Searchlight. So starting with the general overview, point number one. When we began our last term, that would have been last September, a year ago September, uh, we, we, we began that term by looking at the breakup of the Niagara Bible Conference and the writing, publication, and impact of the Schofield Reference Bible by C.I. Schofield. Then we considered the emergence of the Acts 28 position by reviewing the writings of E.W. Bollinger, Sir Robert Anderson, and Charles Welch. After that, we discussed the early dispensational witness of H.A. Ironside and the Mysteries of God in, from 1908 and Sailing with Paul from 1913. In addition, we studied the life and ministry of Lewis Berry Chafer and the founding of Dallas Theological Seminary. So, that's if you weren't here for those lessons, those are all online. Um, you can get everything that we went over about all those things by going to the website and, uh, and listening to that material. Whoops. The majority of our time in the last term was spent tracing the origin of the Grace Movement as a subgroup within American Dispensational Premillennial Fundamentalism. So that's a mouthful for you, okay? American Dispensational Premillennial Fundamentalism. This study led us to consider the life and writings of Harry Boltema, C.R. Stam, and most notably J.C. O'Hare. We spent many weeks chronicling the development of J.C. O'Hare's theology as he moved from Acts 2, I got that in question marks because I'm not sure exactly the date that should have went with that, to the early 1930s, towards Acts 28 and 1935, before he ultimately landed on the position that the church began before Paul wrote Romans, sometime between July 1937 and April 1938. In addition, we also surveyed the early baptism controversy of the 1930s. When we last had class in June, we studied how, once the mid-Acts position was identified, a movement soon sprang up around the position. The first attempt at formal organization was found in the formation of the Worldwide Grace Testimony Mission in January 1939. So that's where we left off uh, three months ago when we stopped for the summer was with the formation of the Worldwide Grace Testimony Mission in July, I'm sorry, in January 1939. So we covered a, I've just summarized there, a, a very broad sort of uh, scope of what we were doing uh, during the last term. So that leaves us now starting this morning, this, this term, which will be the last time we do this. Um, I've got to find a way to end this at some point. I mean, we can't uh, go on for eternity doing this because um, there are many other things that we, should, that we need to study as an assembly. But we're beginning this term with the year 1940. And that's actually a nice place to start because 1940 is the first year that uh, Pastor Stan published the uh, Brain Searchlight. 
The Brain Searchlight began to be published in the year 1940, and I'll show you that here in a minute. So the first section, the first point there is just the general review and summary of what we did in the last term. Now, moving on to the second point, I want to discuss or review some things specific now to Mr. Stam before we move on with, with him this morning. So, we've already seen the following in Lesson 87 regarding Stam's life and ministry. Number one, 1926. In 1926, he came to understand the blessed truth of the mystery with, with its one body and one baptism through the ministry of a New York investment consultant, Mr. <laughs> Earl or, uh, Erling C. Olson, president of Fitch Investors Service. Now, you don't get his name, the gentleman's name, Mr. Olson's name. He does not tell you that in the controversy in the 1960s. He tells you his name in his memoirs, in, this is Stam now, in 2003. And the reason he does this is because this Mr. Olson guy, if you remember from that lesson, basically makes Stam promise that he will not go public with his name as the source of where he learned about um, the one baptism for this dispensation and so forth. So hopefully that's jogging your memory. So that's about 1926 that that, that, that happens. Mr. Olson, point, next point, later gave the Stam family a copy of J.C. O'Hare's two messages, one entitled Jesus Christ, a minister of the circumcision, and the other, the Twelve Apostles and Paul. And that booklet dates conclusively from 1927. Uh, I should have brought it with me. I do have a copy of it at home. If you look in it, he says uh, 1,927 years ago, blah, 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 blah happened. And so you can conclude pretty conclusively based on that date that that booklet uh, is originating in the year 1927 by, by Mr. O'Hare. So this gentleman from, this Mr. Olson fellow, he is, you remember that the Stams at the time are running the Star of Hope mission in New Jersey that they are having all kinds of big name Bible teachers and speakers come to preach at the mission, including names like Gabeline, um, I, I'm going to no doubt miss some of them, but big time Bible teachers of that era were all uh, preaching at the Star of Hope mission. And so in, in the midst of all that, they come to under, the family comes to understand that there's only one baptism for the church, the body of Christ, and they also understand that Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles and so forth. So 1930, next point, Stan became the pastor of Preakness Community Church in Preakness, New Jersey. So he becomes the pastor of the church in 1930. 1932, shortly after accepting the pastorate in Preakness, Stan wrote a booklet titled Water Baptism, Is It Included?, in God's program for this age, in an attempt to explain the baptism controversy that was beginning to swirl. So he becomes pastor of the church in 1930, 1932, he writes this small booklet. Now remember from our previous study in the, in the last term that it's in the, er, the early years of the 30s that the baptism controversy was really starting to swirl up in, in full force. And so in 1932, he writes the booklet weighing in on the subject. Top of page 2, in 1933, Stam enters a controversy with Dr. Gray Barnhouse over his appointment to speak on the subject of water baptism at Harry Boltimus Church in Muskegon, Michigan. So if you recall the details of that account, uh, Mr. Boltima and the Stam, uh, Peter Stam, Mr. Stam's father, had both been in the Reformed Church. Both had been excommunicated out of the Reformed Church because of their, their stance on their belief in dispensational Bible study, and they were excommunicated out of the Reformed Church. So there's a real common link there between the experience of Mr. Boltima here in Muskegon, Michigan, and the experience of the Stam family that was in New Jersey, in the sense that they had a common uh, history in being part of the Reformed Church. They were both excommunicated out of the Reformed Church for similar reasons because of their dispensational belief uh, and approach to Bible study. And so there's a natural connection there then between the Stam family and Mr. Boltima because of that sort of that, that common uh, linkage there. And what happened was Pastor Boltima had made arrangements in, 19, in the summer of 1933 to have uh, Peter Stam, Cornelius' father, come to Michigan to teach on the subject of the one baptism. 
And if you recall from Lesson 87, something occurred and Peter Stam had to go back home to Europe instead of... Uh, so he, um, Cornelius went in his place and came to Muskegon, Michigan in 1933 to teach at the church of Pastor Harry Boltova in Muskegon. Also in 1933, while in Michigan, Stam visited the home of M.R. DeHaan, who was already beginning to question his no-water stance on baptism. The testimony of both Mr. Stam and Mr. O'Hare is clear that for a time in the late 20s, early 30s, M.R. DeHaan of Calvary Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan, was entertaining a, and was accepting of a no water position on the issue of baptism. But when the controversy started to swirl in the early 30s, and Stam is visiting with uh, Baltima in Muskegon, he also takes a trip to Grand Rapids and, and meets with Dahan and reports in the controversy that Dahan was already starting to waver on whether or not he was willing to continue with a stance on uh, no water baptism for the dispensation of grace. And then last point of review, so that means then that from 1934 to 1940, Stam continues to pastor Preakness Bible Church and carry on correspondence with Barnhouse over the subject of water baptism. In addition, Stam writes a few small booklets and pamphlets during the time period on subjects related to the one baptism and Pauline truth. Now, that's a quick review, okay? We spent an entire lesson going over all that stuff, all that history, on the stamps and their um, excommunication from the Reformed Church, the Star of Hope mission. They're coming to see and understand the issue of uh, rightly dividing the word of truth, that Paul is their apostle, and that there's uh, the one baptism question for the, for the church, the body of Christ. So all that stuff in that point is review. So at this point, before we go any further, does anybody have any questions or comments? Mm-hmm. Since there's only four years difference between uh, Stamps coming to see the mis teaching of the mystery and becoming pastor of Preakness Community Church, was he already a pastor? Uh, he was already... He wasn't a pastor in the sense that he was um, pastoring a church. He was a pastor in the sense that he was ordained and working for his father at Star of Hope Mission. So he was preaching and teaching, but he was not pastoring his own assembly where he was the, the lead teaching elder. Okay? That's a good question. Any other questions before we move on from that point? Okay, that brings us then to the Berean Searchlight. Volume 1, number 1. So the very first edition or issue of the Berean Searchlight appeared in March 1940. And it states on the cover, and I, you know, I should have brought this in too. Mike has a copy of it. It's very, he will guard it with his life, by the way. So if you want to look at it, you're going to have to, uh, I'm just fooling. Uh, it, it says right on the cover, it was an organ of Preakness Community Church of Preakness, New Jersey, and was edited by the pastor, which would have been Stan. Even though his name is not on it, it's obvious that he's the editor, okay? So, in its original conception, the Brian Searchlights was supposed to serve as an organ of the Preakness Bible Church in Preakness, New Jersey. The first issue was only four pages long and contained two articles by Stan, the Noble Bereans and Studies in Colossians. Volume 1, number 2, April 1940, offers its reader insight into Stan's associations outside of New Jersey. Okay? So this is second, second, this is number two now, volume one. On the back page, Stam informs his readers that Pastor J.C. O'Hare would be speaking at Preakness Community Church the weekend of April 8th uh, to commemorate the second anniversary of their new church building. So O'Hare, this establishes a connection between O'Hare and Stam as of April, as of March and April 1940. So they know each other. They probably knew each other before that, okay? But there, there were, there's at least some sort of fellowship there going on between them, cooperation. O'Hare is coming to Preakness to uh, preach at the second anniversary of the opening of the church building there at Stam's Church. And that was a, so that would have been April 8, 1940. In addition, Stam spent two weeks in March 1940 traveling and preaching in the Midwest. First, he was at Harry Boltima's church, First Marine Church in Muskegon, Michigan, 
where he addressed an audience of well over a thousand people. And between March, 19th, March 14th and 21st, Stan was at North Shore Church in Chicago uh, ministry, uh, ministering the work there's something I write in that sentence. Mm -hmm. But he to ministering to the work of uh, Pastor J.C. O'Hare. Still don't like that. I'm going to look at that. But so March 1940, he's in Muskegon, Michigan again, preaching at Baltimore's church. And after that, he goes to Chicago and spends uh, seven days with O'Hare at North Shore Church in Chicago. So in April, O'Hare is coming out to his church in New Jersey. So I, I bring this out to point out to you the associations and the relationships here, okay? Stan, by 1940, is friends with, fellowship partners in ministry with, these men in these churches in these cities, okay? And no doubt more than what he actually lists at this point, yeah. Is that First Berean Church in Muskegon still standing, and how big of a building is it? It's a good question. The Korean <coughs> church is still there. I don't know if it's the same building. Oh. That's a lot of people. That'd be, Lee would know the answer to that. Yeah, yeah a thousand people were attending Baltimore's church. Oh, wow. Now, you, but you remember that when he was excommunicated out of the Reformed church, we went over this stuff, right? That there was a lengthy legal battle between the church and the denomination over the control of the property of the building there in Muskegon. And eventually the Michigan State Supreme Court ruled in favor of the denomination and said that Baltimore and his congregation had to leave the premises. You remember this? Uh -huh. And that within a week, the people of the church and the people of the city of Muskegon erected a makeshift tabernacle in downtown Muskegon that was capable of seating over a thousand people. Uh -huh. And they had about 1,200 people there in the first meeting. Uh -huh. Within a week of being evicted from the church. So you're talking here about a completely different era in the religious history of the United States. Okay, this is totally for this kind of thing would never happen today in 2013. It just wouldn't. So when O'Hare when when Stam goes there, he preaches to a thousand people in Baltimore's church. Um, and that's right up the road from here. So again, West Michigan, particularly Grand Rapids and Muskegon area, were a hotbed of activity uh, during this time in history when it comes to the uh, not only f the history of fundamentalism and, and, and uh, premillennial Bible study, but to spe specifically within, quote, mid-acts groups were very active in this area. Next point, volume number one, number five, volume one, number five, this would be July 1940, contains quest quotations from William R. Newell's commentary on Romans as well as a death announcement for his father, Peter Stamm. Now, I want to make a comment about this. Stamm's quotes of Newell are from Newell's first book on Romans, which dates from 1927. If you didn't know this, Newell wrote two books on Romans. The first one from 1927, he says that the baptism in, Ephes in Romans 6 is not water baptism, but spiritual identification with Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. When he rewrites his Ro the Romans commentary later on under a different title, it's not even it's not even exactly identically the same book. He reverses his his position that he took in 1927. Okay, so Stam's quotations here of Newell in in April in July 1940 are coming from his first edition or first book that he wrote on Romans. Volume 1, number 6, would be August 1940, addresses rumors that Peter Stamm died of a broken heart because Cornelius had departed the faith with respect to water baptism. The controversy was so hot and heavy over baptism at this point that there were opponents of Stamm's on the baptism issue that, said, that were going around making allegations that the reason his father died was because he was so brokenhearted about his son's departure from the faith with respect to water baptism. It says it right, Stam addresses it head on at the end of that particular issue of the magazine. Now, volume, volume 1, number 7, September 1940, is important. Okay, And the reason it's important is that it contains a list of available booklets authored by Pastor Stam. 
According to this issue, the following booklets by Stan were in print before or by September 1940. We have included both the titles and a short description offered for each booklet. Okay, So all these booklets Stan has written before September 1940. Okay, The Death of the Cross, it's a meditation on Calvary. Coming to Christ and Bringing Others, an exposition of two significant gospel stories. Water baptism, is it included in God's uh, program for this age? That's the one he wrote in 1932, okay, which we already mentioned. Um, more about baptism, which he advertised as an answer to Pastor Drew's booklet about baptism. I cannot figure out who Pastor Drew is. I don't know if Mike, do you know who that is? Okay. Uh, the Christian public should know. Now that's an important one. That's his correspondence on baptism with America's leading Bible teachers. If you look at the book that Stan writes, The Controversy in the 1960s, there's an entire chapter in there called The Christian Public Should Know. And what that chapter is, is basically a reproduction of this booklet. Okay? This is the booklet that contains the letters and the correspondence between Stan, Barnhouse, Ironside and other leaders within the fundamentalist movement over the issue of baptism. So that's already in print by September 1940. Any questions about any of that? You say that's in the book, The Controversy? That chat there's a chapter in the controversy. It's either chapter one or chapter two that has that exact title, the Christian public should know. And if you read it, he even says, Ernie, in the first or second paragraph that the bulk of this chapter is a reproduction from the book that I wrote, The Christian Public Should Know. Any other questions before we go on? Alright, top of page three. It's important to know that from the very beginning, Stam and the brand searchlight were thoroughly mid-acts in their dispensational stance. Stam and his co-authors, William and Charles Heinze, or Henze, I don't know how do I say that, were clear that the dispensation of grace had been committed to the Apostle Paul and that the church should not begin in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost and was not the subject of prophecy. Now, I put that in here to say this. There is, I can find no evidence in looking into these things that Stam ever went through the type of journey that O'Hare did. Okay, Stam does not, I find no evidence in Stam's thinking that he ever entertained X, the X-28 position, that he ever uh, even gravitated that way at all. He seems to have realized that X-2 was right, or sorry, X-2 was not right, and went immediately to the church had to have started with Paul. Okay, and when you read the first edition of the Searchlight, it is pretty much right out of the gate advocating for what we would have and have identified as a mid-acts position. All right? Number one, vo uh, volume one, number 11, so this would now be January 1941, uh, contains an article called Studies in Colossians by Stam, where he states the following. Quote, see Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 2, 5 through 6. Timothy. Sorry, Timothy, uh, 2, 5 through 6. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And note the words that follow, whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Every Christian should know that, that neither Christ on earth nor Peter in the early chapters of Acts proclaimed the message of reconciliation, the worldwide offer of God's grace. This message could not go forth until it, had, until it had become evident that God was to set aside His people Israel, placing all the children of Adam on the same level. In the Old Testament times, the only way to approach to God uh, for any man was through the Hebrew nation. This was true when our Lord was on earth, but shortly after Israel's leaders had stoned Stephen and sinned against the Holy Spirit, Acts 7.51, God began to set them aside and raised up Paul to go to the Gentiles. Not until, then did the, not until then did the rejected Lord reveal God's hidden purpose of grace. 
Indeed, it was not until we reached the 10th chapter of Acts that we find the first, Gentile, the first Gentiles are saved. And in Acts 11, 19, we find that until then, believers had gone preaching the word to none but the Jews only. This, of course, includes Philip's ministry in Samaria. But in Acts 13, Paul is sent on his first missionary journey. And though it was his practice to go to the Jews first, he constantly had to turn away from them to the Gentiles. Pretty straightforward here. He's saying that Israel is, he's saying that Acts 7.51 is significant. He's saying that uh, with Stephen that Israel sinned against the Holy Spirit. He's saying then because of that, God raised up Paul to go to the Gentiles. And that all this is happening uh, early or in the middle of the Acts chronology, not at the end. So it seems pretty clear that right out from the very beginning, the first uh, volume of the magazine, he is advocating for what we would identify today as a mid-acts position. Volume 1, number 12, February 1941, consists of an article by William Hensey titled, Is the Body of Christ the Fulfillment of Prophecy? Quote, Most premillennial Christians believe that the church which is the body of Christ, Colossians 1.24, is the fulfillment of prophecy. This belief persists in spite of the fact that many accepted Bible scholars, including Dr. Ironside, Dr. Gabeline, and Dr. Pettengill, teach that the body of Christ was a secret hid in God until it was revealed by our ascended Lord to the Apostle Paul. Paul reveals how Christ was raised from the dead according to another purpose, a secret eternal purpose of God, which he calls my gospel, because it was first made known to him by revelation. When God's son, Israel, Exodus 4.22, failed to bring forth fruit unto God under the law, there was, only one, there was only one left who fulfilled those demands, and that, and that one was Christ, God's eternal Son. When God's, son, when God's Son, Israel, committed the unpardonable sin after the Holy Spirit was given at Pentecost, all prophecy and promise were, were humanly speaking, blacked out, leaving only hope, leaving the only hope of their fulfillment in heaven in the person of the rejected Christ. All of the promises now center in Him, but the mystery, God's secret purpose, also centers in Him. In that same edition of the magazine, so again, volume 1, number 12, again February 1941, Stam continues his article that runs through the entire 12 issues on studies in Colossians, which was in the very first issue, and he says the following, the glorified Lord from heaven committed a message to Paul, which he had not committed to the twelve apostles. This cannot be denied in the light of such plain scriptures as Romans 12, 25, Galatians 1, Ephesians 3, Colossians 1, 2 Timothy 2. It is true that the twelve apostles had been sent to every creature, Mark 16, 15, but they were directed to begin at Jerusalem, Luke 24, 47. And since Jerusalem would not receive their message, they could not proceed with, their, with the program our Lord had outlined for them. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth, Acts 1.8. It was for this reason that their headquarters remained at Jerusalem, and it was for this reason that God raised up Paul to carry out a new program. Whereas they were sent with the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of the circumcision, Paul was sent to preach the gospel of the uncircumcision, the word of reconciliation, the gospel of the grace of God. The attitude of the Jews at Antioch of Pisidia was typical of the attitude of Israel as a nation, and Paul's words to them, uh, Paul's words to the Pisidian Jews indicate what God was doing through him. As they contradicted and blasphemed, Paul said it was necessary that the word of God would first be, uh, be spoken unto you, but seeing you put it away from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Unquestionably, all Old Testament prophecy puts the Jew at the head of the nations, and uh, as the one nation through which all nations will be blessed. This is why the twelve were told to begin their ministry at Jerusalem. But with, the, but with the turning of Paul to the Gentiles, we have something quite different. He admits that it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to the Jews, but since they reject it, he will go to the Gentiles nevertheless. What we have here is not, is not the blessing of the Gentiles through Israel, but the blessing of the Gentiles in spite of Israel. God here begins to unfold the mystery, his, his hidden purpose in Christ, only made possible through the cross, that places Jew and Gentile on the same level, Romans 3, 10, and 11, 
uh, offering salvation by grace to individuals from both, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one, one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Now, it's clear to me from these statements that from the earliest volume of the magazine, Stam is mid-Acts. There's no evidence that I can find in any of the writings that I've been able to read by Mr. Stam that he ever entertained Acts 28 or that he ever went through the same type of struggle that we saw going on with O'Hare in the 1930s. There just is not, if he did, he doesn't write about it and it's not <coughs> recorded. Um, but the one thing I'll say about Stam as opposed to O'Hare, O'Hare O'Hare gets an idea, boom, he's writing about it. He's barren his soul about every little thought that he has in, in all these booklets. And that's why, you know, there's some that are seemingly contradicting each other because he gets an idea and if he changes his mind about it, he just fires off another booklet, booklet about it. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but Mr. Stam was more calculated in his writing than O'Hare was. Um, that, to me, is pretty well observable fact just by looking at the nature of their two writing ministries. So let me get this last point, and then I'll ask if there's any questions here. Much more work needs to be done in analyzing the doctrinal contents of the brand searchlight. But for the purposes of this class, we will confine ourselves to Volume 1. The important point here is that from the very beginning of the magazine, Stan was advocating for the mid acts view. We could go on for years if I did an induction on every single article, every single issue and volume of the brand searchlight. I don't want to do that, at least not now. It, we don't need to do that for the purposes of this class. Should it be done? Would it be good for somebody to do it? Yeah, but maybe that's something to do later on in my life or something like that if I decide I want to do it. But we don't need to do that for the purposes of this class. Okay? All right, any questions about this point before we move on? Ronnie and then Mike. <laughs> Can you briefly review the history of Stam's Christianity? How was he saved? Who influenced him early? Why, when, why did he come out of the gate mid-ex? Well, I'm doing some of this purely from memory. Okay. okay, so I don't want you to hold me to it if a few of the details are wrong. But when the Stam family came to the United States from the Netherlands, they settled in New Jersey, and his dad got saved. And when his dad got saved, he gave up a job, at a, a pretty decent job, to start the Star of Hope mission. And the two boys, I think his, his John was his brother, I believe, and, and Cornelius, would go, you know, dad expected them to go to the mission on Wednesday night and Sunday and, you know, all that sort of thing. And the way he tells it, he was under conviction by listening to one of the preachers on a, on a Wednesday night talking about sin and salvation through Christ and hell. And he went home, he and his brother talked about it, and he believed. Now, when, that, when all that's going on, the family is still part of the Reformed Church, I believe. So, it's when they start to study, and I believe they're given a copy of the Schofield Reference Bible that gets that started, and they start to study the Bible dispensationally, and, and then, they, then when that happens, and they're excommunicated, Gabe Line, Pettingill, um, all these big dispensational Bible teachers, uh, some of which were contributing editors of the Schofield Reference Bible, start coming to speak at the mission. So there he's exposed to all that, and in the after-hour conversation, as the family's sitting around the supper table and everything else with these men, a theme starts to develop in the conversation about why are there so many differing opinions about baptism. And so it's out of that that they eventually, his father first starts to realize maybe baptism is not, maybe water baptism is not for today. And then from there, they're introduced to some of O'Hare's writings, and it just seems like they immediately identified Paul as the one through, you know, and wherever Paul's ministry is, then there's the, the, the churches, you know, following thereafter. I guess that's the way I would summarize it off the top of my head. Thank you. Yeah. Mike? Well, you pretty much covered what I was going to say. It was amazing how the contrast between O'Hare and Stam is in their backgrounds. 
and Stan had all the advantages because just like you said, um, all the great teachers of his day came to Star Mission and spoke. And I, I remember reading Stan saying that he, he and his brother would sit around and listen in on these guys having conversations yep. afterwards. And just reading this quote here, you read this quote here, that sounds an awful lot like um, um, Sir Robert Anderson here. So he had apparently had access to all this stuff as a young man. Yeah, and we covered that in more detail back in Lesson 87. Yeah, Fred? On the bottom of page three, the last point here, uh, is, is the body of Christ the fulfillment of prophecy? What, what prophecy are the... Is said to be a, the church to be a fulfillment of. Is that which line are you looking at? Dark bolt point volume one. Uh, number one, well, page three, and the last point. Mm -hmm. So references Colossians one twenty four. What prophecy is being referred to there? Yeah, um, I'd have to. It's a good question, Fred. I'd have to go back and look at the photocopy I made of the. Um, he just kind of says it. He doesn't really. Explain it. I've heard that. Um, so I'm not quite sure exactly what that is. I'll have to go back and look at the context unless That's somebody can. Program, yeah, wouldn't that be Acts 2? Yeah, I think what they're saying is that the events of Acts 2 are fulfilling. He does seem to kind of have it backwards there. I, it, I, I, it's a little curious statement. I would agree, Fred. I was wondering if it's an Old Testament prophecy or. A... Most premillennial Christians believe that the church, which is the body of Christ, is the fulfillment of prophecy. Do most premillennial Christians believe that? I suppose they do. Or at least they may have been at the time. Well, I think most of them do because they think the church started at Pentecost. Which, is which would mean it has to be. Okay. Um, maybe it's the, the words of Christ, I'll build my church in the gates that's, of the church. That's what I was could be referring to that too. That's Okay, so if there's no further questions, I want to go to the last point. Stams. I'm going to get a couple things out of my bag quick. I forgot that. Okay. Stams' involvement in the Worldwide Grace Testimony. Now, we've already seen that the Worldwide Grace Testimony started in January 1939. We've seen that in spring of 1940, Stam was in Chicago at O'Hare's church, and in April 1940, O'Hare was going to be in New Jersey at Stam's church. All right? Pastor Stam's, the Christian public should know, was reprinted in the April 1940 edition of the Worldwide Grace Testimony Quarterly. I have that right here. I was fortunate enough to be given some information. Uh, this thing, this is uh, from April 1940. This is a publication of the quarterly magazine of the Worldwide Grace Testimony, which was established in January 1939. Okay? This was given to me uh, in a stack of stuff at the Memorial Day weekend Bible conference this past May by Pastor Jordan um, of material that I, that I was looking for. And you can see right here on page 4, Top of page four, it says the Christian public should know, and the author is C.R. Stam. This is a reproduction of that entire booklet that runs the length of this quarterly um, from April 1940. Okay? Now, finishing the point, please recall from Lesson 106 that the Worldwide Grace Testimony had been founded in January 1939. So, what that tells you is this. Even though Stam is, Stam is not on the board of the mission, okay? But he knows of it, and he is, and they think they are thinking enough of him to publish this. So this is establishing other other relationships and connections for Mr. Stam at this time. The leader at the time of the Worldwide Grace Testimony is Baker. So now we have Mr. Baker in the magazine, the quarterly magazine of the mission, republishing a booklet written by Stan. So you're starting to see now in the 1940s that some of the big players, I guess, for lack of a better term, within the history of the Grace Movement are, 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 are all knowing each other. And there's beginning to be more cooperation that is going on amongst them. Yeah. What's Baker doing at this time? What's he, what's Baker at this time is the, I believe he's the president of the mission, 
as well as the pastor of the Bible Church in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Doing, he's been doing other things too throughout the 1930s, writing articles for Bible study for brands, working on the radio ministry at North Shore Church, all sorts of other things. That's what that's what Baker's involvement has been. Also of interest, also of interest in the April 1940 edition of the World by Grace Testimony is a short article by Pastor Baker titled "The Transition in the Book of Acts." Okay. This article was written by Pastor Baker to explain a chart designed by a guy named Joe Johnson of Milwaukee. Now, I never heard of Joe Johnson until I, until I looked at this, okay? Now, I'm, I'm gonna, I took a picture of this chart, and I'm going to put it up here. This is a fascinating chart. When, when Pastor Jordan was at my house in June, I showed him this picture, and he was amazed, okay? So this is in the April 1940 edition of the magazine. What's fascinating to me is how, they, how this guy drew the book of Acts, indicating a diminishing here time period within the book of Acts where it says increasing Gentile testimony and decreasing Jewish testimony. And when I showed that to Pastor Jordan, I asked him if he copied this guy's chart <laughs> with the way he talks about the diminishing of Israel on his. And he said that he had never seen this chart before a day in his life. Okay, So this, is written, this chart is drawn and conceived by a layman in the church in Milwaukee named Joe Johnson. Now there's some things on here that I don't necessarily, wouldn't necessarily say it the same way that he does, but I'm showing you this just really for the historical value of it as, a, as an artifact as far as where these guys are at in their thinking at the time. So this chart, and I can make a photocopy of this page so uh, if you want, and I see Mike hastening to write everything down, I can zip a copy of this off when we're done here. But this is the chart that appears on this page, and then the text of what it says underneath the chart is there for you in your notes in page 5. So, this guy within Baker's church draws this. Baker includes it here in the April 1940 edition of the quarterly for the testament, World Wide Grace Testimony. And then he says the following about it. Also, before we read it, I think that the, the title is interesting. The transition in the book of Acts, not the transition of the book of Acts. So what they're identifying is trans transitional things occurring within the book. Okay? So let's read what, what Baker's accompanying um, text said. The above chart is an abridged one designed by our brother Joe Johnson of Milwaukee. It was considered worthy of a place in these pages chiefly because of the unique way in which he illustrates the transition in the book of Acts. Many of the details have been omitted so as to make it as simple as possible. Those who are anti-dispensational see no transition but a continuous unfolding of the program outlined in the gospel narratives. Others who hold the generally accepted dispensational view see the transition taking place between the cross and the day of Pentecost. Some of this school would permit the transition to go as far as Cornelius in Acts 10. These views, however, do not agree with the scriptural record. There is no information of a change in program from the kingdom to the mystery taking place in the first ten chapters of the Acts. For there is a continued and bona fide offer of a kingdom spe specifically uh, described by the Old Testament prophets. The transition plainly begins where? Look, that's an Acts 13 position. The transition plainly begins in Acts 13 with the outcalling of a new and different apostle and the opening of the door of faith to the Gentiles. Here the chart shows by means of a diagonal line how the circumcision ministry of the twelve apostles decreases and is supported <coughs> by the increasing Gentile ministry of the apostle Paul. This continues until the end of the book of Acts, where the former virtually comes to an end, and there is a complete ushering in of the present dispensation of the mystery. Some who have been called ultra-dispensationalists claim that there is no transition in the book of Acts, but that Paul, from chapters 13 to 28, carried out the same program as the twelve, and then at the close of Acts, there was an abrupt breaking off of that program in favor of the ministry of the mystery. 
This view, however, appears to be just as incompatible with the facts as do the other erroneous views which have been considered above. This is a big, this is, for me, I don't maybe I'm a dork, I probably am, but I find all this to be just fascinating. That these guys are, and that, well, that laymen within these churches are so involved in this, and so understanding what these guys are teaching, that they're constructing things, visual aids like this, to, to actually help the guys that are doing the teaching. So, I think it's interesting. He does say that it's simplified. Otherwise, it probably would have been too much to have printed in the magazine. But it's definitely just an interesting thing to note in terms of its historical value. I know it doesn't have anything to do with Sam, but we're talking about this edition of the magazine, and I thought some of you might find it to be interesting. I wonder if Job Johnson's family still has the original chart. Yeah, I mean... I wonder what happened to it. So, next point on page 5. According to Pastor Stam's memoirs, he served as the pastor of the church in Preakness, New Jersey for 13 years until 1943 when J.C. O'Hare asked him to travel the country teaching the word under the auspices of the Worldwide Grace Testimony. So this is what is going to catapult Stam into a more sort of recognizable position. You remember that O'Hare, let's just review a couple facts. Remember that O'Hare, there were missionaries that O'Hare had been supporting in Africa, that his church, the North Shore Church, had been supporting. When those missionaries started to refuse to water baptize the native people, the home mission boards, remember, yanked their financial support and left these guys stranded in Africa. Remember we talked about this in the previous lesson. Okay, So what's, what O'Hare does immediately is, or, is rally together all of the guys, the, 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 the pastors in, in ministry, that were seeing things the same way he was dispensationally, and they moved to form the Worldwide Grace Testimony in January 1939 to help these guys out that are stranded overseas. All right? So O'Hare now, who was involved in that, is now coming to Stam and saying, look, we now want to start sending out some, some men to preach under the auspices of the Worldwide Grace Testimony. And he asks Stam to be one of these guys. Then quoting here from the memoirs. The idea was to get a growing number of grace pastors, and I think that should say and churches, to know one another and to promote fellowship among them. During these years, Stam traveled to every state in the Union, there were only 48 of them then at that time, and four provinces in Canada. So Stam leaves the church in New Jersey to go out and preach around the country under the flagship of the Worldwide Grace Testimony, and he, he leaves New Jersey in 1943. Okay? Any questions about any of that? Yeah. Did he write about that time he traveled and what opposition or anything that he, you know, where he went exactly? Not really. Oh. Not that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. uh, you kind of, I, I sort of had the same thought that you just expressed when you said, oh, Kind of wishing that he would have, yeah. but I, I can't find it. it doesn't, maybe he did, and I don't know where it's at, but he doesn't talk about it. Right? Yeah. Was he single at the time when he did that? No. No. We also have we also have in our possession a resolution drafted by the Worldwide Grace Testimony on May 16, 1944, by Secretary Charles F. Baker. It also identifies Cornelius R. Stam as the mission's traveling representative. The resolution in part reads, Adopted by the World Worldwide Grace Testimony at the Bible Conference conducted at Open Bible Church of Riverdale, Illinois, May 16, 1944, Pastor J.C. O'Hare presiding. Be it resolved that we, the members of the Worldwide Grace Testimony, request our secretary, Pastor Charles F. Baker, so that answers that question, Baker's the secretary of the mission, to have the following letter printed and distributed to Christian brethren throughout this nation, especially to those who are willing to be known as fundamentalists and premillenarians. 
in order that they might know that those things whereof they were informed concerning us are nothing, but that we ourselves also stand for all of the great fundamentals of the Christian faith. So you read between the lines. What's going on? They're being attacked, They're being attacked and smeared, and so they resolve this resolution. Here's a copy of the resolution. Okay? The date is on here. You can look at this afterwards. It says, Adopted by the World Wide Grace Testimony, Illinois, May 16, 1944, J.C. O'Hare presiding. You can read this, and what they're doing is they're talking about, they're setting forth what we believe, what we agree with, and what, where they stand. And the idea was then that this would be distributed out nationwide to correct the record, the false record that was being promoted by their opponents. And if you look at the, the bottom, or the, of the back, it says, Worldwide Grace Testimony, Charles F. Baker, Secretary, Cornelius R. Stam, traveling representative. So the way, I, the way I perceive what happened here is they print this, and as Stam travels the country representing the mission, he's distributing these. Okay, that, that seems, to make very, it seems to be very plausible to me that that's what's going on uh, with, with that. So Stam, and oh, all, all the while he's traveling, he's still writing and continuing with the brain searchlight. Okay, that never stopped throughout all this. So a couple of concluding points and then we'll see if anybody has any questions. Part of Stan's traveling ministry, as I just said, would no doubt have included the distribution of this resolution. It was the combination of the brain searchlight publication and Stan's work as a traveling representative of the Worldwide Grace Testimony that moved Stan into the forefront of the emerging grace movement. Okay. So, from this point on, he is going to be a significant contributor, thinker, and player within what's going on here, along with Baker and O'Hare. Yeah. How old is Stam at this point, around 1940? He's got to be... No, he's younger than 60. I'd say, and again, I'm just guessing based on my memory, he's got to be probably, I'd say, late 30s, early 40s, roughly. Maybe, that's roughly where I would put him as far as age at this point. Okay. So, any other questions about this lesson? Yeah. Can you briefly explain the X-28 position? <laughs> Brief, the, briefly, I'll say that it's a position that maintains that the church, the body of Christ, does not start until after the close of the book of Acts. And they make a distinction between the epistles that Paul wrote during the Acts period and what they call the prison epistles, the epistles that he writes after the close of the book of Acts. And they maintain that there are two separate bodies one during the Acts period, which is fundamentally a continuation of Peter's ministry to uh, Israel. And then there's an abrupt shift that happens in Acts 28 when, when Paul quotes from Isaiah 9. And then that starts the church. Um, Pastor, Pastor O'Hare started in Acts 2, and we went over this in the, in the last term, gravitated toward Acts 28 for a while, and then decided he didn't agree with that, and then started to move his what started to move back towards the middle portions of the book of Acts. And the first position that he articulates that I could, that I think can rightly be called a mid-Acts view is the idea that the church the body of Christ began before Paul wrote the book of Romans in Acts 20. Then from there, and I'm going to show this to you either next week or the, either next week or the, the week after. He starts to even refine that because eventually what he's going to say is, no, it started before Paul wrote his first epistle, which would have included the Thessalonian epistles and um, Galatians. And then eventually in the 1950s, he says it starts in Acts 13. So there's, he, go, he starts here, he goes toward this, and then he, as he comes back this way, he basically makes three stops. 
before he dies in 1958. Okay. So I, I, I'd like to tell you more, but to get into everything would take two hours to explain everything about that. Yeah, Mike? I think it's interesting how historically, um, uh, these are God's men of their times. Um, you've got O'Hare, the businessman that you need for, for to start an organization like this. you got um, Stam, who knows how to run a religious organization, and you got Baker, the trained theologian, who's the secretary, uh, work, working all working together. Plus all the other. Yeah. That's interesting. So when, next week, the next week the study is going to be on the formation of the Grace Gospel Fellowship. The GGF. The GGF is an outgrowth of the Worldwide Grace Testimony. And what ends up happening is the Worldwide Grace Testimony becomes the foreign mission organization, and the Grace Gospel Fellowship becomes the um, home fellowship of churches, if you will, here in the United States. And you could make the argument that it is largely due to stamp one of the factors that leads to the formation of the Grace Gospel Fellowship in 1944 is Stam being a traveling representative of the mission and going all over the country <coughs> teaching uh, under the auspices of the mission. Yeah. In the course of this year's lessons, are we going to get to the breakup of the GGF? Uh, yep. Okay. And that's where things are going to get thorny. I'm just telling you right now. That's where, when we, get to, when we get to that point, that's where some of the people that have been with this class are going to hate me because I'm going to be telling history that they don't like. And the other point is going to be where Richard Jordan breaks with Stan. There's going to be another rub where some people are going to, who are with us are going to no longer like where we go with the class and, and so on. But in all of that, I'm going to try to keep myself to just telling what happened as much as I can. And if I give any commentary on it, making sure that I say, this is my opinion about this, okay? And trying to, trying to distinguish between those factual things that happened and how we maybe should view those things based on... Um, what I, you, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So we are going to talk about that. Yeah. Because it's an important subject in the history of, of the Grace Movement. Because the split between Stam and Baker and Grace Bible College and the GGF is a major turning point. And what year was that? That was in the late 1960s. Okay. Okay. All right, any other questions about this lesson? All right, thanks for your attention, and uh, we'll pick this up again next week with uh, Lesson 108.